Okay, we're going to do another broadcast today, and I felt led to do this one on uh, sharing the truth and preaching the gospel and proclaiming the Word of God as we ought to. Uh, we hear an expression going around in our times, especially in this day and age, where people say, like to say silence is violence, but, you know, in a sense that is true, and we'll see that from Ezekiel 30. 3 verse 7 uh, from the passage 33 son of man I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel so hear the word I speak and give them a warning from me when I say to the wicked you wicked person you will surely die and you do and you do not speak out to dissuade them of their ways the wicked person will die for their sins and I will hold you accountable for their blood but if you warn the wicked person to turn from their ways, and they do not do so, they will surely die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and our sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? So we see God is in essence saying, you know, if you keep silent, you keep silent and you do not warn them about what I'm going to do if they do not repent of their sins and turn from their wicked ways, I will hold you accountable for their blood. I will charge to you the violence they have brought on themselves. And so in a way we see failure to proclaim the gospel message as we should and present it properly and accurately as we should is a form of violence. How dare we think that we could just keep quiet and keep the good news to ourselves when people are perishing in their sins and think, well, you know, as long as it doesn't affect me, you know, let them do what they want to do. Well, that is not the biblical attitude we are supposed to have. You know, Paul even said said this in his one of his letters. He says, Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And that is the basic point that we're getting at today. We see that there is violence in not warning people what the Scripture says, what the Word of God says, and how to be saved from a life of sin and rebellion. And we clearly know that Jesus Christ came into the world to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, so that if we repent of our sins and turn to him by faith, we can be saved. Uh, in Proverbs, Proverbs 14.25, it says, A truthful witness saves lies, lives, but a false witness is deceitful. And so we see a truthful witness is someone who proclaims what is true, and as a result, lives are saved. Now, we can't just say that everyone we share the gospel with or the message with will be saved as a result, but it is our duty and responsibility to share the gospel. As Paul says in one of his letters, preach the word in season or out. Meaning, preach the word whether it's well received or rejected by people. And oftentimes we see there are cases where people reject the message. They, they uh, snub up their nose at the word of God, they laugh, they scoff, they reject it, they they make fun of us for it. Okay, so what? You know, when we see that happen throughout the book of Acts, we see whenever some a group of people would reject the gospel, you know, oftentimes the apostle would say, well, you know, since you consider yourselves unworthy of eternal life, your blood be on your own head, we are free now from our responsibility. Because they only did they discharged the duty they had. They shared the word, they proclaimed the message, and then after that, they left the ball in the people's courts. And there's a lot of Christians that go around saying, well, those Christians, they're just so pushy, and they push their religion on me, and blah, 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 blah. They just so, they try to jam it down my throat. And, you know, that is not the kind of response we as Christians should have when we're sharing the gospel. If somebody says, no, I don't want to hear it, all we can do is just say, okay, you know, I respect your decision, I will go on to the next person, and we continue to go sharing the gospel with people that are open to hearing the message. So the Bible's not saying that we should just force it on people, and if they show that they're just not interested, we shouldn't keep just kicking, 
kicking on their door and try to kick down a closed door. We should go on to the other person. Uh, Jesus taught that if a town or a village would not receive his disciples that he sent out to proclaim the message of the kingdom of heaven was near, they, would should, they were called to do what? Were they called to stick around and just keep trying to persuade the people even though the people were getting obstinate and not wanting to hear it? No. Uh, Jesus said, if any town or village does not listen to you, shake the dust off your feet and go on to another one. And so that's basically the principle we should follow. When somebody's not interested in hearing the message, when we tried our best to share what we know with them and they don't want to hear it, we can just go on to the other person, the next person. We don't have to pressure or persuade. We don't have to be pushy about it. And, you know, one of the things that we often make the mistake of doing as Christians is we get pushy. And if somebody's just not interested in hearing or not ready to hear it, we can't just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Sometimes we got to see that as God's cue. Okay, well, you know, maybe they're just not ready or ripe yet. Just go on to the next person and share with someone else. And so we're not called to be pushy. We're not called to be rude. We're not called to just outright be obnoxious in our efforts to share the gospel. But we are called to share the gospel with people and make the message available for as many people who want to hear it. And so we see that our failure to do so, if we're silent about it, then that is in a sense an act of violence against that person's soul. Because you don't know whether they're going to respond to it or not. All you can do is put it out there and let those who want to come take from it and receive the truth do so. It's kind of like setting out a buffet. You put it out there on the table, but you let people decide whether they come and take what you have put out there. And that's kind of the same principle there. And so the Bible doesn't encourage us to be pushy, but it also doesn't give us the option of being silent and refusing to like speak up when we're supposed to. I mean, if there's an opportunity that presents itself, we're supposed to be bold, as Peter says, Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. That means all we can do is just really be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. The great hope of Jesus Christ, the great hope that our sins are forgiven and we have this new life. Jesus paid the price for our sins so that we no longer have to be controlled by sin, but we can be set free through him and receive forgiveness of all our sins and receive eternal life. And that's the good news. And not everybody's going to want to hear that. Not everybody's going to be willing to listen. But we can't force it on anyone. It's truly the Spirit of God that makes the heart responsive and enables the person to hear the message and to understand it and receive it. And so what we got to do is just be prayerful with every person we do have an opportunity to share the gospel with, that God will work in their hearts and enable them to understand and retain what they've heard. And so sometimes I'll encounter, in the past I've encountered people who said, well, no, I don't want to talk religion, I'm just, just not interested, please, please don't. And so in that case, you just got to say, okay, you know, fine, that's, that's fine, I'll just... I just won't talk about it with you. I'll share it with someone else. You know, and that's sometimes all we can do. And, you know, we got to be respectful, but we got to be bold, too. There's a difference. A lot of people uh, mistake being bold as being pushy or rude, which is not the case. Being bold is just we have the courage to proclaim the full truth as we're supposed to. But we do that with respect. If somebody closes a door in our face, we don't just keep knocking and knocking and knocking and say, open up the door. No, we got to be respectful. We got to be kind. We got to be gentle. And we got to show decency to all people. And that's what's really winsome about when we, when we preach the gospel in such a way, we, we, we make it more of a fragrant aroma. We don't just make ourselves obnoxious and just say, open up here to share the gospel with you. We got to we got to be careful. We got to be wise. We got to be tactful about it. But you know, we also got to proclaim the truth as we should. As a friend of mine used to always says, God can use an imperfect witness, but he can't use a mute witness. Meaning even though some of us aren't as great as sharing the gospel as 
we'd like to be. Maybe some of us say, well, you know, I see that other guy doing it. He's better at it, so I'll just give the job to him. You know, he can do that. I'm not really the evangelistic type. I'm not good at it. No, that's not an excuse. That's not an excuse. Because even people who are not the best at sharing, God can still use the effort they put out. You know, I heard a story. The same friend who said that told me this story about this guy who preached, you know, he was a younger believer, he was new in the faith, and he preached a sermon about Noah and the lion's den. And there were several people that responded to the gospel and got saved. Now, obviously, we know it was not Noah in the lion's den. Noah was the one who built the ark. Daniel was the one in the lion's den. The guy messed up a little bit on his facts. He, he But he made an effort. He made a choice to try to put it out there and you know God still can use us as imperfect as we are we all mess up in many ways we all fumble in many ways and you know yes we should try to be as accurate and biblically uh, accurate as possible no it's not good that he messed up where he said well Noah and the lion's den you know this guy was still making a heartfelt effort to share the faith and to do the Great Commission and so we got to give people like that at least some credit that they're making an effort. It's better to make an effort and fail along the way because we're all in the process of learning and growing and learning how to better better do it next time uh, than to not try at all. You know, we can't be like that servant that just buried his talent and said, well, you know, you know master is hard man. I just, I'll just bury this. I'm not going to put this to use, you know. No. No, that's not the way we should respond. We should try our best to use whatever gifts and abilities the Lord has given us to fully proclaim his word and to try to get the message out there. Even if we slip and fall and stumble along the way, the Lord gives us grace to grow and mature and get better at that skill set. And that's what we got to do. We just got to practice it. And sometimes it's not about just going out and finding people. We sometimes just have to pray. There's been times where I've just had to pray, Lord, send me someone my way that I can share this message with. You know, if, they, if that is something you want me to do today, just prepare a person for me to share with. And, you know, surprisingly, quickly, somebody comes up, we start having a conversation, I share with them, and they're like, wow, I really needed to hear that. And so sometimes you never know how God will answer a prayer like that. Sometimes God will just, or like, for example, you pray, Lord, make me a blessing today. You'd be surprised at how quick God seems to answer prayers like that. I've seen it in my own life. There's days where I get get into prayer and I'm like, Lord, please make me a blessing today. And, you know, boom, someone later on shows up in my life that I somehow, as weak and as incapable on my own as I am, you know, the Lord has used me to bless that person. And it's a really amazing, wonderful thing to see because we see that the Lord oftentimes really quickly answers those prayers. Sometimes we pray for other things and it takes the Lord some time to do that. And sometimes we pray for this or that and God doesn't answer those prayers real fast. But, you know, there's one prayer I really feel like the Lord has answered quickly in my life, even in that same day where I pray, Lord, send me someone that I can share the gospel with. Or, Lord, send me someone who I can be an encouragement or a blessing to. And the Lord quickly answers that. And it's not about us, because apart from him, we can do no good thing. That means that he is the one working through us as Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you to both will and act according to his good pleasure. And so, we can't take the credit for that. Whenever God uses us to bless somebody else's life or to share his good hope of the gospel with someone else, we get no credit whatsoever. That's just the Lord. The Lord provided the opportunity. The Lord worked in you to use your words, to use our words in a way that built that other person up. And that's really just what it's all about, is giving God all the glory, but asking him for the opportunity to be used by him as a vessel, because he wants to pour his life into us. Like, if we were a pitcher, we've got to come to him empty and say, Lord, pour your love and your life into me, so I can then, in turn, pour it into the lives of other people. God bless.